www.hayes.ca slash salary guide. And now, without further ado, I will hand the presentation over to our host, Andy Roblin. Thank you very much, Dina. Hello and a good afternoon uh, or good morning to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on today's webinar where we will share with you the results from our survey of employers and hiring managers uh, across Canada. My name is Andy Robling. I'm VP of Client Development uh, for Hayes Canada. I've worked for Hayes for a little over 25 years i um, been based out of Toronto for the last four. I'm also joined by Shervik Data from our accountancy and finance team uh, here in Toronto, who will be on hand to answer any questions uh, we have at the end of this presentation. Um, we're going to have you for approximately 25 to 30 minutes to share the results of our survey and left a little bit of time at the end for questions. Um, you can send in questions as we go um, or wait until the end um, using the chat function and we'll try and cover as many as we can. Just a little bit about the survey before we get into the detail. As most of you probably know, we produce an annual salary guide which shows typical salaries paid across a selection of industries and functional areas, cross-reference for level of experience and type of company the role may be found in. The salaries are based on what we see every day in the roles we fill and from the candidates we meet. It's become an invaluable reference tool for literally thousands of hiring managers across the country and we're very proud of its simplicity and its user friendliness. If you want to receive a copy of the 2017 guide, go to hayes.ca and you can request a copy from there. In addition to the guide, we also survey our clients about their hiring plans, salary changes, business activity forecasts, and their confidence in the economy. This year, we've included up to five years of data to show trends in the market. And this puts us in a good position to see things where perhaps other people can't and allows us to provide valuable advice and recommendations to our clients and to our candidates. And today's webinar, we're going to be looking at the general market, um, but also results specifically from uh, the accounting and finance function, um, and, uh, and in some cases, the accounting and finance sector. This year, the survey was completed by 4,000 hiring managers, HR professionals, and business leaders across the country. It covered 16 different industries and sectors and 20 functional areas. Um, and I'm going to pull out regional and industry differences and variances as we go. So let's start with the, uh, the headlines. Um, corporate Canada's confidence um, is recovering. Um, uh, it's recovered to 2013 levels in terms of confidence in the economy. Uh, business activity forecasts uh, have returned to the level 2014, so there is some optimism out there in the market. Um, however, hiring and compensation are not expected to increase in line with business activity yet, so there might be a slight lag there. Uh, recruitment, retention, and employee development efforts um, have got to be targeted to align with the business. Um, and also, employers are relying on temp and contract workers for productivity, um, but one of the questions um, we might ask is whether they're actually getting the most um, from that resource um, and more to follow on that. So those are the headlines. Um, so how does the accounting and finance function specifically look? We see that uh, within the uh, accountancy and finance profession, um, business activity forecasts are significantly higher uh, than were seen in 2016. Um, aligned with that, the amount of employees expecting to decrease their headcount um, in 2017 is cut by half. Uh, so, um, so in terms of any reductions, there's fewer, fewer companies, fewer functions that are looking to uh, reduce their heads. And, and lastly, employers are offering competitive salaries to retain and attract top talent. Um, not necessarily um, a major surprise, but we're also going to look at some things that other employers are doing to keep their best people and to attract them in the first place. So let's look at the year's overall uh, market trends. And uh, the, uh, the additional headline is, we have varying degrees of confidence depending on actually where you are in the uh, in the country. 
when we're looking at the salary guide results, we will start with thoughts about the economy in general, whether people think it'll get stronger, whether it'll get weaker, or indeed whether it'll stay the same. And this graph shows the employer economic outlook over the last four years. And you can see uh, a lot of changes, a bumpy time over the last couple of years. So what are we looking at here? Well, the dark blue line is how people thought the economy would strengthen in the next year. So it's a predictor of uh, what people think is going to happen. Uh, the light blue line is how many people think it will weaken. Um, and the, uh, the orange line is uh, that things will stay the same. So if we go back to 2015, we saw the most confidence um, that we've seen uh, in the economy. Almost half of the people thought the economy would strengthen. Um, and uh, indeed, if you in that circle, you can see that uh, more people said it would strengthen than it would stay the same. Um, but unfortunately, as we know, that confidence was uh, badly hit by the oil and gas price. And uh, you can see that was very bad for employee optimism with that big drop in the dark blue line. Uh, the number saying the economy would improve actually dropped um, by a half in one year. But now, if we look at the most recent results, you can see that everything is a little bit better. The dark blue line has crept back up uh, over 30%, so that's a third of employees saying the economy will strengthen. And uh, the light blue line is back below 20%. Um, it's still twice as high as 2015, but it's um, definitely moving in the right direction. And then if we look at uh, the regional breakdown of the same numbers, it's mostly good news. These charts are the same as the last ones. The dark blue line represents employers who think the economy will improve. Um, orange is the ones who think it will stay the same. Um, and you can see that in BC and Ontario, um, on the left-hand side, the dark blue line um, has stayed above the light blue line for the uh, last three years. So yes, confidence took a hit, but employers um, in those provinces were still more positive in their outlook than negative. Um, last year, we did the survey in October, so it was really in the middle of the downturn. There was a lot of uncertainty. So if we go to the right, we see that um, Alberta and Quebec both had more people who said the economy would weaken than strengthen, um, perhaps uh, not surprisingly. However, now it's only Alberta that has more people saying the economy will weaken. Um, those numbers are, are pretty close. Um, and if we look at the dark blue line in uh, Quebec, um, it comes right back up. They're, they're almost as confident as uh, as in BC. So it seems uh, in Quebec certainly there was a great deal of uncertainty, um, but everything's kind of worked out okay. So um, they're pretty sure the economy will strengthen again next year. And if we take a look at uh, the accounting and finance profession and how they see the year ahead. So professionals, professionals here are, are less positive overall. We have 27 saying the economy will strengthen to compared to 31% in the rest of the market. Um, and 17% forecast that it will weaken, which is the same as the overall expectation. So not a big drift, um, but just uh, slightly less confidence uh, from the accounting profession, uh, perhaps, um, in the, uh, uh, than in the overall market. Um, so what does this mean for business activities? We look at the economy, but in terms of how this translates into business activity. Now, the colors here are the same as earlier. So dark blue means that um, business activity increased. And where it's striped, that's the prediction for the year ahead. So let's look at what actually happened in 2016. You can see that half of employers say business activity increased in 2016. Um, and 27% said it stayed the same. So that does show that last year was really not as bad as some people feared it might be. Um, now, what, does the, what do these figures mean for 2017? Well, you can see that people are more confident uh, about 2017 than they were about 2016. We've got about 10% more expecting activity to increase. We still have 10% expecting activity to decrease, um, and that is lower than last year, but it's also uh, still twice as high as 2015. Uh, predictions. 
I'd note that people are always a little bit more confident when they're coming into the year than the outcomes. And you can see that in 2016, 12% uh, thought business activity would decrease. But in the end, 23% said that it really did. So if this is true for the coming year, we're most likely to see about 20% of businesses reduce activity and maybe 55 percent increase. There's still a reasonable gap um, between the two, but um, still plenty of uh, room for growth. Again, breaking this down by region overall, you can see um, a lot of confidence here. Uh, more than 60 percent of employers in BC, Ontario and Quebec are um, expecting activity to increase. And uh, despite a lot of change in the economy, we can see that for those three reasons, the growth in business activity remains fairly consistent year on year. Um, so let's focus on the outlier um, in the top right. Um, if we look at Alberta, we can see that 2015 saw a huge hit. Uh, more than half of Alberta employers had to decrease activity. And uh, this is really the worst of the downturn hitting. Last year um, was actually a lot better than initially expected. Half day activity actually stayed the same and about a quarter saw activity increase. So we think we're actually seeing some more stability in the region. Um, and in this year, we've got some confidence that business activity will stay the same again or improve. It's not all good news as 20% are still expecting decreasing activity, but it does look like a lot more stable year for the region with some hope for growth. Um, and Alberta is very affected by oil and gas. So in a moment, we're going to look at oil and gas um, in a little bit more depth. Um, but before that, um, we'll look at um, how business activity expectations compare specifically within uh, the accounting and uh, finance sector. Business activity was almost exactly aligned to the overall results, with about half seeing an increase, just over a quarter remaining the same, and slightly less than a quarter decreasing. So actually in line with the market. And looking ahead, uh, employers um, in this area are feeling slightly less optimistic than the cross-industry results. We've got about 57% saying activity will increase compared to 62% overall. Um, so it's still uh, a more optimistic forecast for the sector for the next 12 months, but perhaps a little bit more cautious than uh, the market overall. Um, and as I said, let's go, we'll go back to looking at, so we'll look at the impact of oil and gas. Um, we asked uh, all employers about how the oil and gas downturn is affecting them. So in this chart, this is whether the downturn has affected economic outlook. Um, and you can see, going clockwise from the top, um, those first two sections are negatively and very negatively. So we had about 38% of employers saying the downturn adversely affected their uh, economic outlook, perhaps not too surprising. If we look at uh, the, um, uh, this is actually specifically in the uh, the banking and financial services sector, we can see that it's fairly similar, and we've got about 40% saying um, it's affected their business activity. Um, and uh, of those affected, 66% were outside Alberta, which shows that while the worst of the downturn was felt in Alberta, it certainly wasn't um, exclusively there. Um, now we're going to look at uh, which other industries um, are doing well um, across uh, Canada. We, we asked what the strongest performing sector would be. Um, and unsurprisingly, uh, to us, banking, construction, and IT telecoms were the top three. So even though we had uh, within banking 40% uh, saying that the downturn had negatively um, impacted uh, the sector, um, it was still uh, the strongest performing sector. Um, public sector is in there, um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, still strong. Um, and we're uh, we're seeing more investment there from uh, uh, the governments, uh, governments both provincially and uh, federally. And finally, the pharma um, or life sciences um, sector, um, which is one of the most optimistic sectors, with a lot of pharma employees um, saying that they will uh, increase activity for next year. Uh, but what does all this mean for hiring? Um, so we're going to look more in depth at uh, recruitment trends. Let's start first with um, permanent hiring plans. Um, now, like 
like business activity, people tend to be more optimistic at the start of the year than it really turns out. So in 2016, 35% of people said headcount would increase and 15% said it would, it would decrease. But when we asked what actually happened last year, 31% increased with 29 decreasing headcount. So we saw fewer increasing and more decreasing than had been predicted. In 2017, you can see the expectations are similar, maybe a little bit more optimistic than last year. So the outcomes are also similar. We'll see a few more people growing or maintaining headcount, but probably still about a quarter um, decreasing. Um, and this is consistent with pre-downturn numbers, really. It shows that Canadian employers are quite calm and pragmatic almost no matter what the economy does. Um, no one is hiring like crazy when it's good, so they don't have to lay off as, uh, as, as many people when uh, the economy is not doing quite so well. Um, once we've had another couple of years of steady growth, it'll be interesting to see if hiring picks up a bit and maybe getting over that 35% uh, line again. Overall, we expect employers to be very targeted in their headcount increases rather than hiring broadly or increasing team sizes uh, across the board. Um, and uh, regional trends actually look very similar, steady year on year, except Alberta again, which isn't surprising. BC and Quebec are most confident in increasing headcount, um, while most employees in Ontario are expecting actually to, to keep things steady. Um, so going region by region, BC uh, in the top left is very steady, um, while economic confidence took um, a bit of a hit last year. It's didn't really impact on hiring at all. Uh, then in uh, Alberta, you can see that for the past two years, uh, more than 40% of employers have had to cut headcounts. And uh, if we're comparing next year to last year, most employers in Alberta are hoping to keep uh, headcount uh, steady. So um, a more optimistic picture there in terms of hiring plans. Um, where you're hiring, um, I suppose the message there is be strategic. You don't need to vastly increase headcount if you can move resources around or invest in the one or two people you really need to drive results. And then in the uh, excuse me, in the um, bottom left, you can see that Ontario is planning to keep headcounts largely steady again, following a pattern that's been fairly consistent for the past three years. And finally, in Quebec, in the bottom right. Uh, they've seen a bit of fluctuation in the last few years. Um, uh, actually saw fewer companies decrease headcounts last year compared to 2015. Looking ahead, they're almost as confident as BC with half planning to increase headcounts. And again, how does accounting and finance compare with the overall figures? Well, we see that uh, accounting and finance uh, employers are more conservative than the rest of the business community for their hiring plans over the past year. So pretty consistent with thoughts on uh, economic activity um, or an economic outlook and business activity. 62% um, uh, of employers are saying uh, they expect their headcount to stay the same um, in 2017. Um, but the cross-industry average is 53%. So again, just a, a slightly more uh, cautious look there um, from the accounting and finance sector. Um, we're now going to take a, a quick look at uh, temporary hiring. So uh, this is temporary staff um, and use, uh, use of independent contractors. Uh, looking at um, temporary hiring, uh, the very high orange bar indicates that most employers expect to keep temp or contractor use consistent with last year. Uh, very few are decreasing and less than one-fifth um, uh, are increasing temporary or contract uh, headcount. Uh, about 55% of employers say they do use temporary workers. Um, and, but this shows uh, that most employers may be missing some of the opportunity for agility that temp workers offer. We asked about total headcount, so it doesn't show if people are moving those temporary workers or resources around to where they're most needed or will have the biggest impact. But if you are increasing or decreasing temp use, it might indicate a lack of analysis in how employers are actually using contingent workers to really drive results. Uh, we uh, can see that here within uh, temporary hiring within the accounting and finance function also expects that their contract hiring practices will stay fairly similar um, in the coming year as well. So it's a really steady state there uh, in terms of use of contractors. 
So now looking at the skill shortage, how is the talent mismatch in Canada affecting uh, business? Um, we find that the skill shortage gets discussed on and off, um, and since the oil and gas downturn, it hasn't seemed like it's as pressing an issue um, in the media. Um, but for hiring managers who are looking, say, for construction estimators or web developers, it's actually always going to be top of mind. Um, overall, 58% say that Canada has a skill shortage. Um, and this figure is actually uh, matched by the views of the accountancy and finance profession. We also see a similarity when looking at how the skill shortage directly affects different industries. So we have 67% overall saying it does affect them, which is similar to accounting and finance as we say 65% of employers of accountancy and finance staff say yes, the skill shortage is directly uh, affecting them. We did see a bit of a drop in the number of people saying there was a skill shortage, which may actually be due to the oil and gas downturn. Uh, when we asked employers whether the downturn had affected their hiring, uh, that was 25%, so a quarter. 25% uh, say they've been able to hire faster due to the downturn. So um, a quarter of employers said they can actually hire people quickly, which may indicate that the downturn in oil and gas um, has actually led to a slight increase in skills availability. Um, if we look at the cross-industry numbers, we asked uh, the main reason for the skill shortage. You can see that there have been some very slight changes from last year in what is perceived as being to blame. Slightly more employers are blaming things like people not uh, entering the industry, people relocating, and also people leaving uh, the industry to take another job. Uh, the Hayes Global Skills Index highlighted the talent mismatch as a serious concern in Canada. We have the people, but the people don't always have the skills that business needs. The index uh, recommendations include implementing targeted training as well as improving mobility between industries. So breaking down uh, some of the barriers um, and sometimes misconceptions uh, that keep people from uh, changing between industries and or indeed uh, functions as well. Uh, the lack of training and professional development remains uh, the single biggest concern, um, and investing in this will take input from employers, government, industry groups, um, and also educational institutions. And uh, we're actually going to look at this um, a bit more in the next section. Um, but here, um, we're going to take a moment just to have a look at a, a snapshot of the most in-demand jobs for um, the accountancy and finance function. We see accountancy firms uh, expanding. Um, and the uh, the boost um, uh, in the economy has led to growth and also partnership opportunities, which is why we're actually seeing a demand for um, assurance roles. Um, property accountants um, are often in demand because of the niche skills. The uh, the real estate sec the real estate sector often has a specific skill that only can be that can only be hired from within that sector, um, and that just leads to uh, an ongoing. Uh, demand uh, for perhaps a limited pool of talent. Um, and then uh, project and cost accountants. Uh, we have companies becoming perhaps more and more aware of the need to keep themselves on budget. Um, so they're designating accountants for these roles um, uh, and having people specifically employed in these roles as opposed to being a part of uh, a, a general accounting role. So going back to uh, the skills short market, um, how are employers actually attracting talent? And, and we asked, what are you doing to attract uh, top talent? Um, the number one answer was offering competitive salaries. Um, again, as I said at the outset, nothing uh, necessarily very surprising there. Um, but we actually say this every year, which is that, that meeting market rate is uh, a good thing to do. It's important if you can do it, but only one company can actually pay the most. So you have to be able to compete on other things. Um, the two least common attraction tools are promoting career progression and training and development. 
even though these are actually considered very important for both recruitment and retention. Um, in fact, when we ask employers what their retention challenges are, they actually say that the biggest challenge is career progression. Uh, this is followed by the competitive market, i.e. how they can keep others from poaching their top talent. And then sal salary actually comes third, um, and everything else really uh, drops off. It's uh, not so material. So people are leaving jobs because they're not getting career progression, and the people leaving for that reason are likely to be your best people because they're ambitious, and your competitors are looking for them. Um, and the question that we ask um, all of our clients is, are you doing enough to keep hold of your good people? Well, 64% don't have or don't know if they have a succession plan. Um, so that's only one, one third who actually do. That number is up 10% from last year. And a further 20% uh, of um, employers we surveyed said so they are in the process of implementing, implementing a succession plan. So some employers are taking this uh, seriously. Um, interestingly, when we look at the uh, accounting and finance industry, uh, we actually see uh, the same, uh, the, the amount is the same. Uh, and uh, our message here is if you don't have a succession plan or aren't putting one in place, then it's unlikely you'll be able to provide the long-term career progression required for retaining high potential employees, uh, those 10% who are making the biggest difference day to day and who could be your future leaders. So going back to the issue of uh, uh, people, less people entering the industry, so how do we address this particular point. Well, if you look at the uh, the chart on the right, the biggest segments represent lack of awareness uh, in university and college uh, and the industry's perception or uh, stereotype. So those are both an issue of people either not knowing about the industry at all uh, or having misconceptions about it. And if you combine the lack of awareness in university uh, with the dark blue segment representing lack of awareness in grade school, then more than a third of employers say young people are, are just not learning about industries, specific industries in the stage of life when they are choosing their careers. Um, interestingly, in accounting and finance, we can see there's a similar percentage of respondents who believe the lack of awareness um, in schools is contributing to lack of professionals in the field. The number one reason they think there is a lack is because of the perception and stereotype the industry has outside itself. So what can we do about it? Well, to all industries we asked who is responsible for tackling the issue of too few people joining the industry. And 35% of employers say that they, um, organizations, are responsible for addressing this, which um, I think is very promising indeed. Um, a lot of employers um, believe uh, and are taking, believe that they are responsible and are taking responsibility for themselves. The remaining 65% spread responsibility across the government, educational bodies, and industry groups. Um, and uh, I do think uh, this is an issue that needs a combined effort to address. The uh, Hayes Global Skills Index, uh, which I quoted previously, showed that Canada's education system is inflexible, meaning that it can't adapt quickly to new skill demand. So government and educators need to combine efforts and create more agile education programs that prepare young people for the workforce. And employers and industry groups must ensure they're communicating their needs with educators and also with government. So to uh, the crux of the guide. How is all of this um, going to affect salaries? So on this graph, you've got, uh, we have five years of salary trends. Uh, the dark blue line is how many people uh, did not increase salaries. Um, orange is increased by 3% or less. And the light blue is increased by more than 3%. So overall, we have 81% of employers saying they will increase salaries next year, with 55% expecting increases of less than 3%. And if we just look at the light blue and the dark blue bars, you can see that since 2013, we've seen a continuing decrease in the proportion offering more than 3% increases. Uh, it's gone down from more than 40% in 2013 to just 27% uh, last year. 
And then the uh, the dark blue line, the people with no increases, has gone from 15% in 2013 to 25%. So over the past five years, we've seen a lot fewer companies implementing across the board increases above 3%, and more people either having no increase or increases more or less in line with the cost of living. Time back to the oil and gas trends, we also heard from 19% of employers that they have been able to offer lower than usual compensation due to the downturn. So this could be reducing pressure to increase uh, in some industries uh, or in some areas. Looking specifically at the accounting and finance functions, starting on the left, 54% gave a pay rise in line, as I said, roughly with the cost of uh, living. Um, it's 10% uh, higher than the overall number. Um, looking ahead, 63% uh, say they will be over that again, which is 15% higher than overall. What's interesting is that about the same proportion as in other sectors are getting more than 3%. Uh, so more accounting and finance professionals overall received a pay increase in 2016 and can expect an increase in 2017. Now looking at how employers in general intend to adjust compensation, um, in the top chart we have whether people are changing compensation plans uh, to attract talent. So in that dark blue wedge, you can see that 20% of employers have already altered compensation plans to attract top talent. And altogether, 64% are willing to alter salaries. So this really shows that employers are not offering widespread increases beyond cost of living, but they are willing to adjust to attract the specific talent they need. And looking at the chart below, the gray and blue shows where people are feeling wage pressure, so you can see that it's highest at the mid to senior level. Uh, overall, more than 60% are feeling at least some wage pressure at these levels, and almost as many say they've experienced it at director level and above. So I would predict that we'll see employers giving really targeted compensation increases to the employers who are the most important to retain. Again, the 10% who drive results and are the future leaders of, uh, of their businesses. Uh, looking at what Canadian accounting and finance, uh, finance professionals told us, about two-thirds got uh, a pay increase last year, um, and 71% of employers say they will get a salary increase next year. Uh, we'll see next year if this is accurate. Um, if you're not planning to increase salaries, keep in mind your employees' expectations. I don't think everyone needs a pay rise uh, every year, but if you're not meeting expectations about compensation, then you need to be communicating with employees about why that is and look at other areas of improvement, such as benefits, which is a great place to transition to our next slide, um, which is where we're asking what employees might be missing from the benefits plans. Look at benefits. Um, we've talked a lot about targeted attraction, um, and I think uh, a company's benefits package is one of the best ways to stand out. So we asked employees what benefits were most valuable to them, and these are the top five. So vacation, performance bonuses, pension, RISP support, training and development, and flexible workouts. So these represent opportunities for you to stand out and offer candidates what they really want. But how many employees are actually offering these? Um, the top benefit is always vacation. We know from experience placing candidates, it's very rare for anyone to accept less vacation time than they already get. Yet only 56% of employers offer more than two weeks to new hires. Just under half of employers offer bonuses. 52% offer pension or RRSP support. Uh, we've talked about the importance of training and development, um, but yet only 47% of employers include it in their package, and finding flexible work options, which 49% of employers have. So these are all huge opportunities. If you offer one or more of these, then you're doing better than about half of your competitors. So let's look at what employers are planning for next year. These are the benefits that employers are planning to add next year. Um, these are in fairly small numbers. There are about 5% of employers plan to add flexible working options, for example. However, it does show that employers are looking for ways to differentiate. 
what I think is most important is that this list really resembles the one above. So employers know what is valuable to candidates. However, there is one big missing piece. Training and development support is not in the top five in the lower list. It's actually not even in the top 10 of what employers plan to add next year. So less than 2% of employers say they're adding this to attract or retain talent. So if you're not training to get the skills you need, and you're not training to address productivity issues, and you don't include training in your benefits as a recruitment or retention tool, then you're really missing a very important opportunity. I think one barrier is that people see training as an expensive exercise, but it doesn't have to be. You can bring an external trainer for a half day to help train a large proportion of staff, but a lot of knowledge already exists inside your company, so organizing lunch and learns or setting up an internal mentorship program to help pass that knowledge on can help. Training support uh, includes offering time off for employees to pursue their own activities or investing in a membership to an online training program. So there are lots of ways you can offer training no matter what your company size or budget. So that's the uh, large picture. Now, what's the summary? So we're going to start with our key findings. Firstly, confidence in the economy is improving. Uh, employers outside of Alberta are optimistic for future business activity. Um, Alberta is hoping for modest improvement, as we said. Um, employers are using contingent workers to manage workload, um, but don't have visibility on those resources. So I said one of the questions we would ask is whether they're actually been used uh, to full effect. Skill shortages are top of employers' concerns, and most are focused on compensation um, and then benefits to attract talent. And salary increases of less than 3% persist with employers targeting increases to get and keep the best talent. Um, building on that, we have our top five recommendations that we think will help you and your team succeed this year. The first one, um, going back to the point about targeted hiring, is targeted hiring to the roles that will make the biggest difference, but also monitoring workloads across the business to ensure key staff are not overburdened. Consider professionals with the right experience or attitude over very specific educational backgrounds to expand your hiring pool. You can train for technical skills and should be looking for more opportunities to do this. Add training as a benefit to engage and also to retain high potential employees as well as to grow your own experts. If you're not sure what to expect from next year, as other employers consider using temporary or contract resources uh, to keep up with uh, changes in the business environment, and also create a talent pipeline even if you're not currently hiring by developing your employer brand online. Okay, so that's the end of the key messages we wanted to share with you today. Um, I want to thank everyone who's dialed in uh, for joining us and listening. I hope you found it useful and that you've got one or two constructive ideas from it.